Good evening, dear listeners. I am Dr. Renu Rita Silvano of the Order of Consecrated Virgins, and I live and work in Mumbai as director of the Catholic Bible Institute. His Eminence, Cardinal Gracious, has invited me to speak to you this evening on the topic of consecrated life in the Catholic Church. First, I would invite you to notice that the correct word is consecrated life and not as it was formerly called religious life. This change in focus and understanding came about from the Second Vatican Council's teachings. And so the Vatican Department in Rome, which helps the Pope to govern and take care of the men and women living lifelong committed celibate lives, was renamed as the Congregation for Institutes of Consecrated Life and Societies of Apostolic Life. Pope St. John Paul II wrote a very inspiring and comprehensive apostolic exhortation in 1996 on this topic called Vita Consecrata, subtitled On the Consecrated Life and Its Mission in the Church and in the World. And Pope, Pope Francis also has written beautifully about consecrated life and encouraged us with warm words on many occasions. So why this change in nomenclature? Because it is not only religious priests and sisters who live consecrated lives in the church, taking the three vows of poverty, chastity, and obedience, and living in communities, but there are also many men and women who do not belong to any religious congregation or secular institute, who do not live in community under a superior, but only take the vow of celibacy or pledge of virginity for life. Such are, for example, male hermits and female consecrated virgins living in the world. The Catechism of the Catholic Church in its section on consecrated life describes, first of all, the hermits and virgins, then the life of religious priests and nuns, etc., in Numbers 922 following. If we look at the number of consecrated men and women in the world today, it is large. According to the latest statistics released by the Vatican, the church today counts 6,41,661 women religious and 1,32,191 priests belonging to various religious congregations. As for secular institutes, there are 21,000 466 women members and 614 non-ordained men. The order of consecrated virgins living in the world, a most ancient form of consecrated life in the church and in our time restored by the Second Vatican Council, has about 7,000 members in the whole world eight of whom are in Mumbai. We know that by baptism, each and every member of the body of Christ is initiated into an intimate relationship with Jesus as brother, savior, and Lord. This includes a spousal relationship with Jesus because the whole church is the bride of Christ. As the book of Revelation declares, the spirit and the bride say, come, come, Lord. Therefore, not only those in consecrated life, but the whole church, laity, religious, uh, clergy, 
and all consecrated people, they, we are all called to holiness in the modern world. Pope Francis has emphasized this point in his recent writing, Gaudete et Exultate, translated Be Glad and Rejoice, which was issued on 19th March 2018. Even though all the faithful are called to holiness, nevertheless, according to Jesus' own words, there is also a special call for some disciples to forfeit the privilege of marriage for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. In Matthew's Gospel, we read in chapter 19, verses 10 to 12, on one occasion when the Pharisees were arguing with Jesus about divorce, they were astonished by his answers. The disciples said to Jesus then, if such is the case, then it is better not to marry. But Jesus said to them, not all can receive this saying, but only those to whom it is given. For there are eunuchs who have been so from birth, there are eunuchs who have been made so by men, and there are eunuchs who have made themselves so for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. Whoever is able to receive this, let him or her receive it. From these words of Jesus, we see that the state of consecrated life is not meant for all Christians, but it is a special vocation for those whom God chooses. Saint Paul explained about the practical aspect of this life when writing to the Corinthian church. And he writes, I want you to be free from anxieties. The unmarried man is anxious about the affairs of the Lord, how to please the Lord. But the married man is anxious about worldly affairs, how to please his wife, and his interests are divided. And the unmarried woman is anxious about the affairs of the Lord, how to be holy in body and spirit. But the married woman is anxious about worldly affairs, how to please her husband. And St. Paul writes, I say this for your own benefit, not to lay any restraint upon you, but to promote good order and to secure your undivided devotion to the Lord. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 32 to 38. Coming now to the official church teaching on consecrated life, let us look briefly at some of the texts from the Catechism of the Catholic Church. In number 915, it teaches that Christ proposes the evangelical counsels in their great variety to every disciple. The perfection of charity to which all the faithful are called entails for those who freely follow the call to consecrated life, the obligation of practicing chastity in celibacy for the sake of the kingdom, poverty and obedience. It is the profession of these counsels within a permanent state of the, cons of the life recognized by the church that characterizes the life consecrated to God. To put this in simpler language, the CCC is stating that all Christians are called to practice the virtues of poverty, chastity, and obedience in their own situations and circumstances of life. And in so doing, they will practice the perfection of charity, living out the beatitudes taught by Jesus and the command of Jesus to love one another as I have loved you. Notice that the virtue of chastity 
is practiced in marriage as well, where the spouses are faithful to each other in their conjugal relationship. So fidelity and chastity go together, as it were. On the other hand, those who have discerned a call to consecrated life are obliged to live out the perfection of charity by practicing chastity in their celibacy. Poverty and obedience within their common living in community or outside, plus their various apostolic ministries. Further, the Catholic Catechism in 916 number says, the state of consecrated life is thus one way of experiencing a more intimate consecration, which is rooted in baptism and dedicated totally to God. In the consecrated life, Christ's faithful, moved by the Holy Spirit, propose to follow Jesus Christ more closely, to give themselves to God who is loved above all, and pursuing the perfection of charity in the service of the kingdom, to signify and proclaim in the church the glory of the world to come. This is a wonderful reality of consecrated life, that already here on earth, it is meant to signify and proclaim the glory of the world to come. We are called to be signs of the life united with God in heaven forever. How much are we consecrated men and women really consciously aware of this profound reality? What is the daily witness of life that we give to those around us of being especially called and chosen to show forth the goodness, gentleness, humility, forbearance, obedience, justice, and mercy of God and of Jesus Christ. Through our relationships, our thoughts, words, and deeds, first in our own communities, and then among those whom we serve. It is worth mentioning at this point that in 2015, the Dicastery for Consecrated Life in Rome commissioned a survey on consecrated life, which revealed that the men and women in institutes of consecrated life are the happiest people in the world when compared with other people. How is that? Well, they share a spiritual, spousal relationship with Jesus, their bridegroom and Lord, which is most fulfilling. And true fulfillment brings true happiness. That is why I have subtitled this talk with the phrase, a marriage made in heaven. The form of consecrated life with which I'm personally familiar is consecrated virginity lived out in the world. It is among the oldest forms of consecrated life in the church. Just one example, the sister of the great fourth century bishop, Saint Ambrose of Milan, who baptized Saint Augustine, was a consecrated virgin. She received the veil of consecrated virginity from Pope Liberius in Rome. And Saint Ambrose dedicated his work, his writing on virginity, written in 377, to her, his sister, Marcelina. You see, in those first centuries of Christianity, there were no religious congregations founded yet. These came later after Saint Benedict founded monasteries 
and his sister Scholastica founded convents in the 6th century. In our times, it is the spirit-filled Second Vatican Council which has restored the ancient form of consecrated life, the Ordo Virginum, with the solemn consecration by a bishop for virgins living in the world. A revised liturgical rite, R-I-T-E, liturgical rite, for this was promulgated by Pope Saint Paul on May the 31st, 1970. So this year we celebrate the golden jubilee of the revised liturgical rite of consecration of virgins. By this solemn rite, the virgin is constituted a sacred person, a transcendent sign of the church's love for Christ, and an eschatological image of the heavenly bride of Christ and of the life to come. And this is taken from the Catholic Catechism numbers 922 to 924. We have already pointed out earlier how consecrated life proclaims and signifies here on earth the life of the world to come. In simpler words, all this means that through this sacramental, the consecration of virgins, at the hands of the diocesan bishop, the woman receiving consecration enters a public state of consecrated life in the church. And she receives the ancient title, Bride of Christ, a title shared with the church herself. As with other forms of consecrated life, the order of virgins establishes a woman living in the world in prayer, penance, service of her brothers and sisters in the world, and apostolic activity. According to the state of life and spiritual gifts and talents given to her by God. And consecrated virgins can form themselves into associations to observe their commitment more faithfully. The Vatican has organized several world conferences for the order of consecrated virgins. And I was happy to represent India at three of them. Most recently, I was asked to speak at the 2016 conference in Rome. But sadly, this year's World Congress in Rome to celebrate our Golden Jubilee was cancelled because of the COVID pandemic. Still, Pope Francis wrote a very heartening message for us, saying, and I read, I wish to join you in giving thanks for the twofold gift of the Lord to his church, the renewed rite of consecration and an ordo fidelium restored to the ecclesial community. Your form of life has its primary source in the rite of consecration and its juridical configuration in Canon 604 of the Code of Canon Law. And since 2018 in the instruction for bishops called Ecclesiae Sponsae Imago, in English, the image of the church as bride. Your vocation is a sign of the inexhaustible and manifold riches of the gifts of the Spirit, of the risen Lord who makes all things new. It is likewise a sign of hope pointing to the fidelity of the Father who even today awakens in the hearts of some women the desire to be consecrated to the Lord in virginity, lived out in a concrete social and cultural setting, rooted in the particular church, and expressed in a way of life that is ancient, yet modern and ever new. 
Well, coming back now to the other forms of consecrated life, the Catholic Catechism teaches in number 9, 25, 26, and 27. Religious life is distinguished from other forms of consecrated life by its liturgical character, public profession of evangelical counsels, that is, the vows, community life led in common, and witness given to the union of Christ with the church. Religious life in its various forms is called to signify the very charity of God in the language of our time. All religious take their place among the collaborators of the diocesan bishop in his pastoral duty. History witnesses to the outstanding service rendered by religious families in the propagation of the faith and in the formation of new churches, from the ancient monastic institutions to the medieval orders, all the way to the more recent congregations. There are thousands of religious orders and congregations some are only contemplative, and their main apostolate is prayer. Others are apostolic and missionary, going out to the ends of the earth to serve needy humanity in Jesus' name. Among male orders, there are the Jesuits, the largest with 16,000 consecrated men, Many branches of the Franciscans, Dominicans, the Salesians, and so many more. And among women, there are the Carmelites, the Kenoshans, the missionaries of charity, and so many more. Next, the Catholic Catechism speaks about secular institutes in Numbers 928 and 929 explaining a secular institute is an institute of consecrated life in which the Christian faithful living in the world strive for the perfection of charity and work for the sanctification of the world, especially from within. By a life perfectly and entirely consecrated to such sanctification, the members of secular institutes share in the church's task of evangelization in the world and from within the world, where their presence acts as leaven in the world. Next, in number 930, the CCC describes the societies of apostolic life, explaining that alongside the different forms of consecrated life, are societies of apostolic life whose members, without religious vows, pursue the particular apostolic purpose of their society and lead a life as brothers or sisters in common according to a particular manner of life, striving for the perfection of charity through the observance of their constitutions. Among these, there are societies in which the members embrace the evangelical councils according to their constitutions. Now, with such a variety of consecrated life, one would expect a near perfect church. However, the reality is that nothing comes automatically. We need to remain connected as the branches to the vine. First of all, connected to our Lord God in and through faithfulness in prayer, personal prayer, and connected to our community members or institute members through communication and dialogue, sharing and common activities so that we do not become isolated or individualistic. 
this would become a danger and block to our growth in holiness and fruitfulness in ministry. I would conclude by saying that all the different forms of consecrated life derive their meaning and inspiration from Jesus' call. Come, follow me, and remain in me as I remain in you. Then you will bear fruit that will last. All the consecrated share a spousal relationship with Jesus, their bridegroom. All are personally involved in a marriage in heaven and all show forth the richness of love in the mystery of the church, the body of Christ, the bride of Christ. May their numbers increase. And if any of you, dear listeners, hear the call of Jesus to consecrated life, do not be afraid or hesitant because of peer pressure or lure of the world. Respond to Jesus with courage and joy. You will never regret it. You will only become better equipped and enriched for greater things. Praise be Jesus, our loving friend, who calls, who knocks on our doors, and who strengthens us with his refreshing and consoling word. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. Dear friends, we just heard Dr. Renu speak to you about consecrated life. They are persons who live a life of virginity, who come from God's holy people. They are our own, from our own families, joined by the ties of family or friendship. God has called them to be more closely united to himself and to be dedicated to the service of the church and of mankind. We now dedicate this time of prayer to them and pray that God may continue to bless them abundantly. A reading from the first letter of St. Paul to the Corinthians. I would like you to be free from anxieties. He who is not married is concerned about the things of the Lord and how to please the Lord, while he who is married is taken up with the things of the world and how to please his wife, and he is divided in his interests. Likewise, the unmarried woman and the virgin are concerned with the service of the Lord to be holy in body and spirit. The married woman instead worries about the things of the world and how to please her husband. I say this for your own good. I do not wish to lay any restriction upon you but to lead you to a beautiful life and to be entirely devoted to the Lord. If anyone is not sure whether he is behaving correctly with his fiancé because of the ardor of his passion and consider, considers it is better to get married, let him do so. He commits no sin. But if another of firmer heart thinks that he can control his passion and decides not to marry so that his fiancée may remain a virgin, he does better. So then, he who marries does well, and he who does not marry does better. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Take my Consecrated to your care, take my 
Christians are called to practice the virtues of poverty, chastity, and obedience in their own situation and circumstances of life, and in so doing, they will practice the perfection of charity, living out the Beatitudes taught by Jesus and the command of Jesus to love one another as I have loved you. This is a wonderful reality of consecrated life that already here on earth it is meant to signify and proclaim the glory of the world to come. We are called to be signs of the life united with God in heaven forever. Let us now present our prayers before the Lord for those who belong to the consecrated life. Our response will be, Lord, hear our prayer. Please repeat, Lord, hear our prayer. May those who are called to be in the congregation of institutes of consecrated life and societies of apostolic life possess great fervor in spreading the kingdom of God and in giving to the world the spirit of Christ. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. May their life of holiness, their prayers and good works accomplish God's plan of salvation for the Holy Church and for human society. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. May the gift of their vocation find expression within the symphonic unity of the church, which is built up when she can see in women capable of living the gift of sisterhood. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. May they keep aglow the prophetic nature of their vocation. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. May they who are called by God's mercy to make their life a reflection of the face of the church, the bride of Christ, bring fulfillment, love, and joy to our world. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. Saints like Lucy and Cecilia and Agnes were all women consecrated virgins who decided to forsake earthly marriage for a higher one. May those who have consecrated before God to have one divine spouse live their life in service to God and his church with mercy and compassion. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. May their virginal consecration help the church to love the poor 
to help those who are weak and vulnerable, those suffering from physical and mental illness, the young and the elderly, and all those in danger of being marginalized or discarded. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. May they be women who believe in the revolutionary nature of love and tenderness. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. May they be a sign of the spousal love uniting Christ to the church, virgin and mother, sister and friend of all. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. May they, by their gentleness, weave a web of authentic relationships that can help to make neighborhoods of our cities less lonely and anonymous. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. May they have the wisdom, the resourcefulness, and the authority of charity in order to stand up to arrogance and to prevent abuse of power. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. May the Lord bless all these women preparing to receive this consecration and all those who will receive it in the future. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. Father in heaven, may those chosen as consecrated men and women be consciously aware of the reality of daily witnessing Christ to the world, for they are specially called to show forth the goodness, gentleness, humility, forbearance, obedience, justice, and mercy of God through our relationships, thoughts, words, and deeds among those they serve. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Our hearts were made for you, Lord. Our hearts were made for you. They will never find, never find, never find rest until they find their rest in you. When you call me, I will answer. When you seek me, you will find. I will lead you back for exile. I will wheel to for you, Lord. Our hearts will make for you. They'll never find, never find, never find rest until they find their rest in you. I will take you from the nations. I will bring you to your idols I will cleanse you, and you cherish my command. Our hearts were made for you, Lord. Our hearts were made for you. They'll never find, never find, never find rest. Till they find 
find your way.